Hi guys, I apologize for not being in class. I'm actually in lab training the department on the use of some new technology. Um, I figured I'd record this quick little lecture on percent composition before you did the Pogel on empirical formulas. You will have homework tonight out of the Honors Chemistry textbook that um, deals with percent composition. If you find that this video goes too fast, because again, remember, I only get 15 minutes on Screencast-O-Matic, please feel free to click the pause button so that you can copy down what you see before you proceed to the next. I would suggest that for um, what we're doing right now, you have an Honors book in front of you. Uh, and I'll tell you what page to turn to in a minute. All right, so we're going to deal with percent composition today, and we're going to start with a very simple example. We're going to start with just a quick refresher uh, of some middle school math. So we have a beaker here in this notes, this set of notes, and there's seven particles in the, in the beaker. You'll notice that there are some pink particles, and then there are some yellow particles. If I have to figure out the percent composition of the substances in this beaker, it's really pretty straightforward. So the percent of yellow particles in this beaker if I can find my cursor here, um, is essentially the number of yellow dots that you see in the beaker divided by the total number of dots. And you take that fraction and multiply it by 100 in, in order to change that value from a decimal to a percent. Okay, so let's count. How many yellow dots do you see in the beaker? So 1, 2, 3, 4 out of 7. So 4 divided by 7 times 100 is 57%. So 57% of the sample is composed of yellow atoms, basically. All right, well, what percent are pink? All right, so again, let's count. There are 1, 2, 3 pink particles out of 7 total. So 3 divided by 7 times 100 is 43%. You will notice that the percent of yellow plus the percent of pink must add up to 100% because those are the only two particles that are in this particular container. All right, so the conclusion is, if you have seven particles in the beaker, from our experiment, we have just found out that 57% were yellow, 43% were pink. Okay, great. What if I decided to scale up this sample size? What if instead of being given seven particles in a beaker now, I give you 100? Well, you guys know the definition of percent. The, the word percent means out of every 100. So 57% means that you have 57 particles out of every 100 being yellow, right? Well, how about pink? Well, if 43% is pink based on our experiment, and percent means out of every 100, then 43 particles out of 100 of this new ramped up um, sample size would be pink dots, all right? But what if I wanted you um, to scale up my sample that you're analyzing even further? What if instead of being given 100 particles, I now give you 500 particles? And I wanted to ask you, well, how many of these now are yellow and how many are pink? Well, this is really simple to do because all you have to do is substitute into the original formulas that I gave you at the top of the notes. So you know the percent is e of yellow is equal to the number of yellow over the total. So just take this formula and substitute new values into this formula, all right? You know the percentage, all right? You now have a new total number of particles. You can substitute that in. That leaves you a variable here in the numerator that you can solve for, all right? You would do the same thing for pink. So let's take a look here at the bottom. So how many are yellow? Well, if 57% are yellow, you go ahead and substitute in the percentage over here to the left of the equal sign. And now you're using 100 total particles, so you substitute that in the denominator of the fraction. It leaves you a variable in the numerator that you need to solve for, all right? And so to solve for y, all you simply would do is do 0.57 times 500. Now, what you want to watch out for is that when you do substitute your percentage into the formula, that you actually write it as a decimal, all right? That's one place where a lot of students forget, okay, that de percentages have to be re rewritten as decimals when you actually go to substitute them into these formulas. All right, so how many yellow particles now do you have in this sample? So it's 500 times 0.57 or 285. You could do the same kind of substitution to figure out how many pink particles there are in this 500 particle sample. Um, if you were to do that, I, didn't, I don't show this here in the notes, you would calculate that there would be 215 um, particles out of the 500 that were pink. You'll notice that 285 plus 215 add up to 500, okay? Well, what does this have to do with chemistry? Basically, 
to come up with an empirical formula, which we'll, we'll explore in the Pogel, you have to start by figuring out the percent composition of a substance. All right? And the kind of math that you use is exactly like the math that you just saw in this example with these yellow, these silly yellow dots and these silly pink dots. Okay? All right, so let me pull up the next set of notes so you can see um, some sample problems. Some of these come from your book, some I've added. All right, so we're going to start by talking about how to calculate percent composition from data. And when you calculate percent composition from data, what you're calculating is something um, that we call um, an empirical percent composition. So the word empirical means that it is experimentally determined. So empirical means from experiment, so from data. Why are we starting here? Because historically, this is what happened first in, in, in this field that we call chemistry. All right. So um, the first person to calculate percent compositions from data, or one of the, you know, the mo most important notable people who did this, was Anton Lavoisier, the father of modern chemistry. He did these kinds of calculations before a system of formula writing was created. And he did these types of calculations before we had an understanding that, that matter was made of atoms. All right, well, what did Lavoisier do? Lavoisier studied materials, all right? Here's the problem. He didn't know what any of those materials were made of. He knew they were made of elements, and he knew that he could do certain things to them to figure out how much of each element was in that substance. All right, so for instance, we're going to start on page 326 with sample problem 10.9. So let's assume that Lavoisier did this experiment. So let's say, for instance, Lavoisier had this white powder, and he knew the white powder was made out of magnesium and oxygen. And let's just say, for, for the sake of saying that he knew he called it magnesium oxide. But he didn't know the formula because he didn't know that magnesium oxide was made up of atoms and he didn't really know what the ratio of those atoms were, like how, like what number of magnesiums combined with what number of oxygens. We're lucky that we have that information today, but he was working, you know, with a blank slate. He didn't know any of this, all right? And so let's say, for instance, that our friend Lavoisier took 13.60 grams of this stuff and decided to decompose it. And that's basically what he did. He would take materials and he would sit in his, in his lab and he would decompose things, usually to elements or to simpler substances, measure the elements that he was able to make from decomposition, and then try to come up with the percent of each thing um, in the substance. So in this particular case, we have magnesium oxide. And I, you notice that I wrote the formula um, Mg sub X O sub Y because he didn't know anything about formulas or subscripts. But let's assume he took 13.60 grams of this and he decided to decompose it. So you would heat it because that's a binary substance. You know that we decompose things to elements. So in this particular case, you would make some magnesium and you would make some oxygen. Now notice that I wrote the formula for oxygen incorrectly because again, remember, he did not know that oxygen was diatomic. He just knew that it was an element that was in this white powder, okay? And let's say that out of 13.60 grams of this white powder, he was actually able to produce 5.40 grams of oxygen gas, all right? What is the percent composition of this material? When I ask what is the percent composition, what I want to know is what percent of this initial substance, this MgXOY, um, this stuff here, what percent was magnesium, what percent was oxygen? All right, well, I know that you make 5.40 grams of oxygen because you measured that. Well, how much magnesium do you make? It's simply the difference between your initial sample size and how much oxygen you made. Because you notice that the mass of your products, 8.20, plus 5.40 should equal the mass of the sample that you initially decomposed. All right, so let's see here. What's the percent of magnesium? To calculate the percent of magnesium, you take the mass of magnesium, which is 8.20, right? You see that? Um, that's right here. And you divide it by the total mass of the sample that you use, the 13.60. That's that down there, All right? You take those two values, you multiply, you divide them, multiply by 100 to change it to percent, and you find that magnesium oxide 60.3 percent magnesium. Okay, then you do the same type of calculation for the percent of oxygen. So you take the mass of oxygen, 
that he was able to produce from decomposing this stuff, which is 5.40. And then you take that, you divide it by original sample size, which was 13.0, times 100, and you find that your sample is 39.7% magnesium. So it didn't matter where that magnesium oxide came from to Lavoisier. It didn't matter what amount he used when he did this analysis. All right. Every time that he did this experiment with magnesium oxide, he found that 60.3% was magnesium, 39.7% was oxygen. He found these repeated ratios. Could he explain them? No. It wasn't until John Dalton came in the middle of the 1800s that that was explained away, right, when he came up with his idea of the atom. All Lavoisier knew was that every time he did this experiment, he got the same numbers, okay? Nowadays, we understand that it's because magnesium and oxygen always combine in the same ratios, but he did not have the luxury of that information, okay? All right, well, what if instead of analyzing 13.6 um, grams of magnesium oxide, I wanted to analyze 25 grams? What if I wanted to figure out how many grams of oxygen you would end up with if you started with a 25 gram sample. Well, that's simple enough to do. It's a matter of substituting into the same formula. So if you know that magnesium oxide is 60.3% magnesium by mass and 39.7% oxygen by mass, then that, that question is, is a matter of substituting into the formula that you used above, right? So remember the percent of oxygen was the max mass of oxygen that you made divided by the total mass. All right, well, what was your percent of oxygen that you calculated from that 13.60 um, gram sample? You figured out that it was 39.7%. So change that to a decimal and substitute it here into the formula. All right, well, instead of using a mass of 13.60 over here in the denominator, now use a mass of 25 grams. Solve for the numerator, which is the variable that you don't have. All right, and so to solve for the mass of oxygen, you just cross multiply 25 by 0.397. You'll find that now with this new ramped up sample, 9.9 .9 grams is oxygen. All right, so this, these are the kinds of questions that you might have to do in a lab situation where you are basically decomposing something and then you're weighing what's left and figuring out your percents in order to figure out what a formula um, is for your substance, which is essentially what you're going to do in that empirical formula pogol. All right. Let me show you one last thing before I go, before my 15 minutes of fame is up. All right. I need to show you how to calculate something um, called a theoretical percent composition. So this is theoretical. Uh, and so in theoretical percent compositions, an example of this is going to be on page 327. It's sample 10, um, 10. So in this particular case, they're going to ask me to calculate a percent composition given a formula. And so this is what was done after Lavoisier, after we discovered that atoms existed, after we had a system of, of coming up with formulas. We knew the ratios. If you have a formula, your life is a thousand times easier. All right, so for instance, what if you want to know the percent composition of propane? Like what percent of carbon by mass is in propane? And what percent of hydrogen by mass is in propane? Well, it's a very similar formula. Your percent of carbon in propane by mass is essentially three times the atomic mass of carbon off the periodic table, right? Divided by the molar mass of propane off the periodic table. You take that and you multiply that by 100 to change it to a percent. Okay, great. How do you do the percent of hydrogen? Well, if you look at the formula, there are eight hydrogens. So you do eight times the atomic mass of hydrogen in the numerator divided by the molar mass of propane in the denominator times 100. All right, so this is so much easier because you don't have to use experimental data. You can just use the masses off the periodic table to figure out what's the percent of carbon and what's the percent of hydrogen. You just have to take into account the subscripts in the formula. All right, so what's the percent of carbon that you end up with? You should end up with 81.68%. What's the percent of hydrogen? It's 18.3%. Now, you'll notice that carbon is reported to four significant figures. Hydrogen is reported to three. That's because you're doing both multiplication and addition. And so there's some funky things that are going on here in these particular calculations. I'm not going to be that nitpicky um, with your answers. The chapters are on Blackboard through the announcements page. The questions that you have assigned for homework are also there. You might want to do this um, before tackling the empirical formula pogol. I don't know. It depends um, if you get stuck with the empirical formula pogol. All right. I'll see you guys on Thursday.